You're listening to Workplace Perspective, an employment law podcast presented by Sapphire Legal. Workplace Perspective is a regular podcast series for employers and employees focusing on education, training, and the law to help organizations of all sizes develop and maintain successful workplace relationships. The opinions expressed by guests on Workplace Perspective do not necessarily reflect those of Sapphire Legal or its attorneys and should not be considered legal advice. And now, here's your host, founder and principal attorney at Sapphire Legal, Teresa McQueen. Thank you, James, and welcome everyone to Workplace Perspective, where we are striving to raise the bar at workplaces everywhere. Today, Buffer is back. We are talking with Nicole Miller. Nicole is a people operations manager at the social media management company, Buffer. She's passionate about remote work and promotes a values-driven company culture. In May 2020, uh, Buffer began experimenting with a four-day work week, which turned into a long-term pilot program, which ran through the end of this year, 2020. Nicole is with us today to talk about the lessons learned and what's next going to be a great show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Opinions expressed by guests on Workplace Perspective do not necessarily reflect those of Sapphire Legal or its attorneys and should not be considered legal advice. You're listening to Workplace Perspective, an employment law podcast presented by Sapphire Legal. Welcome back to our listeners and welcome to Workplace Perspective, Nicole Miller. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm super excited to have you on. I've been wanting to talk about this four week, four day work week for like all of last year when I found, quite when I first found out about it. So before we get started real quick, why don't you tell all our listeners about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you. Um, I am a people operations manager at Buffer. So, um, I consider doing the fun stuff of, of, of HR, but also, um, I have always viewed it as internal community building because been a really fun journey through Buffer um, as far as we've grown as a company. And um, I also, as you mentioned, I'm very passionate about um, like family inclusivity and um, building policies that are very human centered within our company. And then hopefully then being able to um, be an example for other uh, workplaces of the future. Well, that's awesome. And I know I I hate to bring COVID into every show, (laughs) but I do think that You know, one of the things that it's done is it's really, I think, brought the future to us much quicker than a lot of us in the business world anticipated. And part of that are these more flexible work environments. Yeah. And I, I'm so excited to hear it. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask you the big question that, you know, so what prompted the four day work week experiment? Yeah. Well, um, this is where I would have brought in COVID-19 anyway. So, um, (laughs) We had toyed with the idea of a four-day work week before. We did a really light test of it in 2019, and we called them half-day summer Fridays, where we did a half a day off a week. Um, and in, it it was okay. It didn't really feel like the right time or it didn't really show the right ROI or we didn't really know what we were looking for exactly. Um, and so when COVID came into play, especially in March, when schools were closing and parents at home with kids and all of these routines were sort of uprooted. We wanted to support all of our teammates, um, no matter their situation. And so we did a lot of surveying. We did a lot of asking what people wanted. Um, and, you know, some of our theories, like maybe people want an extra stipend to like buy their kid an iPad or something to distract them, to help with their work day. Um, everything turned out to be a little bit different from what we expected as far as what people wanted was time and a, a, a better balance of work life, especially to figure out all of these things mentally to cope with all of the stresses and, and all of the things going on. And so that's when the four day work week came back into focus because this felt like the right time to test that out just for mental health reasons more than anything else. I think that's great. Um, it's really interesting to me. I think that if companies put as much effort into it as you all did, they would find the same thing that what they think their employees want is not exactly this. It doesn't jive typically. And I love that idea that, you know, that that willingness to listen to what it is and to bring that idea back. Cause I do think sometimes these things start as, 
you know, like casual Fridays. I think worst thing ever, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but it's a whole different can of worms. But I do think that they think, oh, you know, this will be great, but they don't really think about the implications of it or is it what people want or, you know, all those sorts of things. So what were some of your initial findings um, with the with the experiment? Yeah. So as you mentioned, we did it for a month um, in May 2020 and just sort of said, like we set our expectations to say, like, we don't necessarily expect a 100% productivity, especially given the pandemic and the stress of it. And then with the four day work week, we know there's going to be 20% less stuff done and that's okay. We want people to feel supported and mentally as stable as possible right now. And what we found was it did have a huge impact on autonomy and independence and control of their own schedule and stress levels did decrease. Um, and we tracked all of that through different surveys. Um, and then we also found that actually our productivity didn't take as much of a hit as we sort of expected. And so it was like, huh, well, like maybe we can try this. And it also didn't feel right to just kind of stop right then and there. Cause even in June, 2020, things didn't necessarily feel all that much better globally. And so we thought, okay, maybe let's just keep going with this. Let's try it. Let's sort of emphasize, um, that we're going to start a longer experiment. Cause one month didn't really feel like it was a valid measure of like the true effectiveness of this. So that's when we decided from June to December to go into a longer trial. I think that's important too, because you really can't in a month, you can't. Yeah. I mean, think about how long it took just myself. I'm sure you guys and everybody that's listening when everybody went home in March, Mm -hmm. my husband worked from home, like from March until May, they went back to their office in May, but it took all that time to get, and we'd worked together on occasion from home before, because I always work from home. And occasionally he'd beat it was fine, but this was like every day. Mm-hmm. And by the time they, I was so sad to see him go back to work. We had gotten in this routine, but it took, it took a little while to, mm-hmm. you know, to figure that out. So that's really wise to know that one month is not going to tell you mm-hmm. much about it. Um, and then, so tell me, what surprised you the most, do you think? Well, we weren't exactly, I'll, I'll, on the flip side, we were not surprised at how much people loved it. <laughs> um, you know, we, we got a lot of praise for it, a lot of gratitude, um, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence about how much this really helped with family balance and homeschooling and all of the things that went with that. Um I should also mention along the lines of it being a four-day work week, we, we did encourage people to do like shorter five-day work weeks and all of that too, to whatever sort of worked for their schedule. But I'd say the thing that surprised us most was just the level of how consistent our productivity did stay. Um, we didn't have um, a, a firm goal or deadlines and we did adjust things given the pandemic Um, but it felt like things were still on track and that we were still moving forward. So we did, we were very surprised that like it kept us going in a direction and we didn't feel like we were lacking overall with, um, general productivity. And now we've implemented OKRs, um, for quarter one, 2020, 2021. And so we're going to keep testing that (laughs) as a, a, how effective it is. That's great. So I want to get into the specifics like you didn't insist okay so we're going to do this you're going to work four days a week everybody has to clock in at 8 30 and clock out at six or whatever so how did that aspect of it work yeah yeah and buffer has always been remote and so most everyone has worked from home or worked from co-working spaces and so we have had a pretty long history of giving people autonomy and what they need to do to work their most productive um week and so we, we never dictate hours. Um, I'd say the only area where we do have some sort of guideline or expectation around really communicating when you're online is our customer support team, just so that we know we have people, um, covering our support inbox, um, you know, sort of around the clock. And then we ask, you know, our advocates to communicate around that. But even then we aren't quite as like clock in, clock out as I, I think some workspaces can be. So we really did tell people to make this their own. We do have like a rotating schedule for advocates. So not everyone just takes the Friday off. 
the bulk of our company does take Fridays off. And we experimented with that day too. For a while, we did Wednesdays off and found that a lot of people liked it, but it was also not necessarily getting the results we wanted. We also found that with Fridays off, given that we're a global and fully distributed company, that gave us the most time zone overlap. Mm -hmm. And we also heard anecdotally that the three-day weekend was really more restful and more restorative than like the one day in the middle of the week off. Um, So we really have encouraged people to sort of, you know, make it their own. And like I said, I have have two little kids. And so I tend to try to just do shorter work days so that I can hang out with them in the afternoons since they go to bed early and, and all of that. So a lot of our parents have sort of adopted that, which is great. And then a really fun benefit with uh, Fridays being off company wide is that a lot of people have adopted this sort of overflow day mentality where they'll jump online for like an hour or two, but we have no meetings um, and we have no Slack like expectation of responding in our, in Slack or in any of our other tools. And so you get some really quiet, deep work days that are really nice. I do love that. Those days you looked at your calendar, we used to, we used to call them work days. You yeah. Know? So like those were work days because they're right. sitting on the calendar and you knew uh-huh. we're going to get a lot accomplished, right? Yeah. As long as nobody coming in and out the door, you'd be all right. <laughs> right. So what would you say to um, employers who were super hesitant about giving um, autonomy mm-hmm. and that sort of um, self-scheduling responsibility to their employees? Yeah, I do think similar with remote work that it doesn't necessarily work for everyone or every company. So I I do think that it does take some self-reflection for individuals and for companies. Um, I also think for us, this was very much led by our CEO um, as an effort. And he has supported that from, from the very beginning. And that has helped a lot because he sort of helped set the tone and expectations for it. So you need to have that leadership buy-in. And for us, the other thing that's really helping is very clear goals and expectations. And so if you have a project that you know has an X deadline and a Y sort of outcome, as long as you're grading those and as long as people are getting that done, then it doesn't necessarily matter, you know, that they worked on it for a five day work week or a four day work week. And, and we did find that people have really just cut out some of the fluff of their work week. And those four days are maybe a lot more intense than the five days. Um, but people are figuring that out and we're pushing them and we're telling them to make sure that they're holding themselves and their, their colleagues accountable to getting things done. And of course, I'm sure, you know, like every other organization, there's people that that works for and people that it doesn't work for. Yeah. And are you still you're, you know, you're holding people accountable and when they're not accountable, you're taking appropriate steps and those sorts of things? Yeah, definitely. And we also did um, once we wrapped our pilot program from 2020, when we shared that we were going to continue this in 2021, we did also set the expectation that this is still an ongoing experiment. It could change at any time. So don't get necessarily too attached to it. We'll be grateful for it while we have it. And um, because if we aren't hitting our company goals too, then, then that doesn't make sense. And if we aren't delivering good customer experiences, then that's not great for us long-term either. So, so we've asked for that. And then we've also really um, emphasized that, you know, if you aren't performing, then your manager will ask you to work a five day work week and, and put in that those extra hours it might need to to sort of get to where you need to be. Um, and that this is a privilege and not just a necessarily a right within the company. So, you know, we one area where it was really hard to necessarily determine how this looks was with support. And so um, we did set expectations around answering this many tickets in order to have four day work weeks. But if you can't get those tickets done in four days, then you might need to work either even just a little bit on that Friday. And if it's a couple hours and then you take the rest of the day off, like that's still, that's still great. Um, So, so that's something that we're continuing to monitor and encourage. I love that. I love that. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue talking with Nicole about Buffer's four day work week experiment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. 
Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. Or if that resume was from someone who worked 12 hour shifts at the recycling company with my dad, who's 72. That taught me a work ethic that I carry with me every day. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone growing up where I did. A lot of things could have gotten in the way of my goals, but I learned to push through and that's what I bring to work every day. So maybe it's time we look beyond the resume and look to grads of life. Discover new ways to develop great talent that are so much more than what's on paper at gradsoflife.org. A public service announcement brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. If you enjoyed today's show, do this. Share us. Like us. Give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It sure means a lot to us, and it ensures that more people tune in and raise the bar at workplaces everywhere. Welcome back, everyone. We are talking with Nicole Miller, People Operations Manager at social media management company Buffer, about the company's decision to initiate a four-day work week pilot program. So let's get let's get back into it. Nicole, one of the things I'm curious about, and I, I'm sure our listeners are too. So when you talk about surveying and planning and all those things, can you tell us a little bit about what that looked like? Um, how much time, what sort of things did you do? Maybe some of the questions you asked and and how you use that data to come up with your plan? Definitely. So a big part of my role is um, team engagement and surveys. And so we do, we've experimented with quarterly surveys, weekly surveys, uh, twice a year surveys, all of that. Um, and we do keep changing our frequency, especially based on how many uh, or how much or how little it, it feels at the time, or if people are, are tired of being surveyed. Um, and so when it came to COVID though, it was, um, something that people were very, uh, willing to share their thoughts and fears and uncertainties and all of that with us. Um, and so we did a, a really long in-depth survey, um, from the platform that we use culture amp. Um, and they had a template in there that was really great. And a lot of these survey companies, um, lattice, tiny pulse, um, culture amp. Um, I'm sure you could even find templates online, um, that you could put in a Google form have really, you know, basic questions. And a lot of those are developed by psychologists. Um, and those are really helpful starting points. And then you can customize it based on your company and your employees. Um, and so I think that was a great starting point for us. And then one thing we surveyed deeper about was to our parents, um, because we have a family support fund where we, we try to support our families in a different way by giving an additional stipend in order to sort of help with the extra cost and all of that associated with like childcare or whatever that is, or elder care. We, we help with, um, you know, family members beyond just children and so it was similar with COVID, like are, are there people who are taking care of their parents? Are there people who are um, potentially homeschooling now and they weren't before? Um, what about the families where both parents are working and, and all of that? And so with that one, we especially asked questions of like, um, like what would be helpful? And we listed like more money, a flexible schedule, educational stipend for your kids, like all these different things and asked people to pick one. And then we asked people to pick like what would be the next most helpful thing because I wanted to see the correlation between like like is it just money or is it just like like a Netflix subscription like what would help we wanted to you know help in any way we were sort of feeling very desperate to help um, you know Disney Plus for everyone whatever it was um, and so we found people picked the flexible work schedule or like more time or more days off in the week or more vacation time. And it was all about time. We had a few people who were like, yeah, like an iPad or um, more money would be great. But like, it was a really small percentage of parents. And so that was a really impactful bit of feedback that we got. Um, and we felt like that was, it was really specific to parents, but we also felt like that would also be applicable for people who, who weren't, who didn't have children, who were taking care of their parents or who, um, you know, were, were living alone in an apartment. Um, and so that was really helpful for our data there. And, and we spent a lot of time evaluating that. I'd say I probably put in, um, 
a couple like solid <laughs> work weeks just on collecting data, evaluating data and putting together proposals and sort of running by that our leads and our CEO um, for each iteration of the four day work week. I think that's amazing. I, and I think that's a really interesting uh, commentary on the organization where people are saying, I'd rather have more time than money. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, from an outside perspective, that looks like, OK, we're, we're probably paying our employees pretty good. And now, you know, Maslow's hierarchy. Right. <laughs> so we got that need satisfied. And now it's this. And it's great to be able to focus on that. You know, kids are fed, you know, groceries on the table, got the car, got the house. You know, we're good. Now we want to learn. Now, now we want to focus on managing this life we have. And I think that's so awesome. What was your response rate on the surveys? I mean, did you, was it incentivized or did you just get great response or? Yeah, I think we've trained our team really well with surveys uh, because we do a lot of them and because we're really uh, diligent about making sure we act on surveys. And we also transparently share like a summary of the results from surveys. So people get to see what the overall feel is. Um, and we'll share like positive and negative things. So like if we're not doing well in an area, we, we tell our team and we own it and we commit to like these actions that are going to hope, hopefully address it or change it. And that has helped for us because there is that concept of survey fatigue where it's like, I've told you what I wanted. I've told you it again and again and again, and nothing has changed. So I'm not even going to bother telling you. So for us, we tend to get around 70% participation rate, which is pretty high. Um, and, and I think for I think for the parent survey, we had pretty much every parent <laughs> chime in. So I can't remember exactly though. It was really high. And I would like, you know, that one's less anonymous too. It was still anonymous, but I was able to like DM or message all of our parents individually because we have 20, 25 of them. Or, but I was able to like, you know, we're such a small team that I can really individually reach out to people and say, hey, did you get this done? We really want to make sure your voice is heard in this. In this. So um, that's a helpful component for us is a really small company. Yeah, but 70, 70%, that's pretty good. <laughs> and I do think that that's, you know, it's trust because you're right. If, if you're going to ask it, be prepared to mm -hmm. do something. I mean, I think that's going above and beyond you know, sharing it and all that stuff. And I think that's great transparency and that is great, but what did you do with it? And I think that's really impactful with employees mm -hmm. because employees want that they want that trust. They want to know that they're valued and their input matters in a true way, not just a sort of bureaucratic blather, as we <laughs> love saying on this show, right? You're telling us what we want to hear and to get what you want. And it, it, people see right through that. Do you think that this would have been as successful as it has been thus far without the pandemic? Honestly, no. <laughs> I think the pandemic provided that launching point that had been a hurdle for a while because we had we had a lot of teammates who had been asking for this for a long time. And like New Zealand uh, had experimented with this in some way. And there were like there was a Japanese company that did it that was getting a lot of press. And we do internally ask our teammates to sort of push us and, and to be proponents of like future of work initiatives. And so this was one that came up and we just didn't really feel like it could be successful. Um, and then our, our view of what mattered perhaps, or our view of productivity um, changed with the pandemic because it impacted everyone so globally. And there have been times where, you know, maybe because uh, we're global, a global team and, and distributed, we have about 85 teammates across 15 countries and so there might be times where like one country is experiencing something, but it doesn't, you know, the rest of the team doesn't maybe feel it in the same way. And, you know, COVID-19 was such a universal thing that everyone was completely in the same situation um, to some effect or to some extent. And so that I think really jolted us a bit and said, okay, well, now we have this latitude and now we have this big opportunity in this um, in this issue. And so we really tried to look at like, what's a creative way that we can address it um, and make our team feel supported and make them feel heard and make sure that we are focusing on, on the people and the human component of our, of our workplace. Such an interesting aspect. Um, I love the universal, you know, it's 
I'm always looking, I'm a little mishopeful, but I like the, you know, I like to find the the hopeful aspects in things. And it is sort of something that did bring us together, you know, closer as a global community um, with our own unique challenges and all that sort of stuff. I know you said you had management support from the top, but just in our last few minutes, can you give us a, a little a little insight into how did the employees react and, you know, how did management react with regard to this? Yeah, um, I think to share very honestly, I think management was a little apprehensive um, because we are you know, holding people to standards. We're hoping we're holding our advocates to a certain response time and we want to be, you know, held to those goals. And so our managers were maybe a bit like, how am I going to make this work? And how am I going to make sure this is still fair, right? Getting stuff done and giving this time off. Um, our team, our, our team overwhelmingly was also very just excited about it. And our managers themselves were excited about it because they got to work a four day work week too. And so, um, so there was some, there was definitely some hesitation and, and we are a company that likes to experiment. And so we do frame everything that it might not be permanent. And so that's a helpful thing too, to say like, if this isn't working, then we will be honest about that and we will adjust it going forward. So, so we keep that in mind. I think that's great. Well, as we kind of wrap up, because we're running out of time today, is there any sort of insights or food for thought that you can give to our listeners who might be wanting to suggest this to their companies or uh, people who are decision makers and companies who might want to present it to their organization? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that you can um, encourage this or sell it from a very practical standpoint. Um, there's a lot of research out there around how time doesn't necessarily equal output. Um, obviously, this depends on the work you're in, but especially for um, knowledge workers um, where creativity and, and brain capacity is is fairly limited, that there's a lot of data to support this. And I also encourage, like, try it for a couple of weeks or try to adjust something small and, and, and institute a half day off or a meeting free day even, and just see what that feels like. And there's small ways that you can maybe test the waters and without rolling it out on a company wide level or whatever that looks like. So I always just try something, <laughs> try something small and, and build up that trust and build up that track record of it being impactful. I love it. Great words, great thoughts. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being on the show and, talking about this experiment, the good, bad, and well, it just sounds like good to me, but (laughs) thank you. (laughs) We loved having you. So um, you can learn more about uh, Nicole and connect with her on LinkedIn at www.linkedin.com slash I N slash N Miller one. That's LinkedIn.com I N slash N M I L L E R one. Check out Buffer's social media management capabilities at buffer.com. And you can also connect with Nicole via our website at sapphirelegal.com slash podcast. I want to also thank our listeners, my radio angels, James and the name at night and workplace perspectives team extraordinaire, our engineer and producer, Paul Roberts, our associate producer, Melissa DeLacy, with music provided by the very talented Stephen Versaloni. Thank you all for joining us on Workplace Perspective. And until next time, keep raising the bar.